We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. We're going to be dealing with a difficult passage of Scripture. And hopefully we'll deal with it adequately. Okay? Now, um, for those of you that need to know the title of the message, the title of the message is Tempting God. Okay? So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, and let's look at verse specifically, two verses, just two. Verse 26 and 27. 26 says, For if we willfully sin, No, it doesn't. I read that backwards. Excuse me. It says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now, devouring the adversaries is devouring the adversaries of the Lord our God. That's who's going to be devoured, okay? Now, this is a very difficult passage of Scripture. What does it mean to willfully sin after having received knowledge of the truth? What does it mean that there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin? What is the writer of Hebrews talking about? Is willful sin, after having received knowledge of the truth, the unpardonable sin? No, thank God. Tough questions to answer, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Now you be, may be wondering, why are you entitling this message, Tempting God, when you are talking about Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and 27? Well... Hang with me, and hopefully, you'll see. The first thing I want us to look at tonight is what is traditionally taught about the meaning of these verses. Now, I looked up a whole bunch of scholars and what they had to say about this passage of Scripture. And most scholars believe that this is not talking about routine sins, such as lying, cheating, whatever. What, they, uh, what most scholars believe these verses are talking about is the sin of apostasy, or specifically denying the atonement brought about by Yeshua's death at Calvary. Now one commentary that I did find interesting was... Believe it or not, David Stern's commentary in the Jewish New Testament commentary that he wrote. And in this commentary, he considers these verses to mean that one has their faith entirely wrapped up in the Levitical sacrificial system to make atonement for them after coming to their knowledge of Yeshua's atoning death and then denying Yeshua. Ooh. Wow. That's powerful, folks. Yeah. That's how this Jewish scholar believes what this text means. In other words, they come to the knowledge of Yeshua's atoning sacrifice and death. They know about that. But yet they still reject it in favor of the Levitical priest sacrificial system that was just a foreshadow of Yeshua who was coming. That's what most scholars believe this verse means. But here's another question for you. Actually, it's several questions. What if the text means exactly what it says? <laughs> what if it means that if we willfully sin 
after having received the knowledge of sin, in other words, after we learn that God considers it a sin, that there is no more sacrifice for that sin. Now, that sin or that person? The sin. Does that sound like a state that you would want to find yourself in? A state where you are denying the atoning work of Yeshua? Or that you are committing a sin that you know is a sin? Because if this scripture means exactly what it says, then there's no more sacrifice for that sin. That's a scary place to be. I don't want to be there. I think that sometimes the people of God are guilty of trying to explain away their disobedience to the Word of God. You don't know how many times I have heard people say to me that they knew that what they were doing was wrong, but they went ahead and did it anyway because they believed that God will forgive me. And they callously say that just like God's automatically obligated to forgive us. Is he? Interesting thought, isn't it? Now, when we assume such an attitude towards sin, are we tempting God? Is tempting God something that we dare attempt? Not if you're smart. When Yeshua was being tempted by Hasatan in the wilderness, his response to one of those temptations as found in Matthew chapter 4 verse 7 was, It is also written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And in that he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. Where he says, let me turn there real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. He says, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massah. Okay? The passage in Deuteronomy is telling the people of God not to tempt him as they did at the waters of Massah when they cried out that they were dying of thirst and accused God of bringing them into the wilderness to die there. Why did God bring them into the wilderness? To deliver them from Egypt. And the only thing that kept them in the wilderness for 40 years was their disobedience to the commandments of God. Now, that was a very bold accusation for those people to make against God. And God responded to that accusation by threatening to wipe the whole bunch of them out. He said to Moses, let me wipe these people out and I will start over again with you. That would have been the punishment that they deserved, but Moses, thank God, interceded on their behalf and our merciful, loving God spared them. God is gracious and God is loving and His mercy endures forever. But we had better not tempt the Lord our God. So here's my question for you tonight. Are you going to tempt the Lord your God? How much of a gambler are you? How many chances are you willing to take? What sin are you willing to commit even though you know it's wrong? Are you counting on a gracious and loving and merciful God to forgive you for your willful sin? And if you are, what if this verse in Hebrews 10 means exactly what it says? 
that there remaineth no more sacrifice for that sin. Are you willing to take such a chance? Is that sin worth it? Is that is it sin if both Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 16 and Yeshua in Matthew 4, 7 tells us not to tempt the Lord our God? Is it worth it? That sin. Scripture talks about the sin that so easily besets us. You know why it so easily besets us? Because we like it. We love it. We want some more of it. It's the old song with <laughs> We need to reconsider our attitude towards both this scripture in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, and in our attitude towards sin in general. Now folks, I know that this message is heavy. And I know that it is not a popular subject. I know that most people would rather hear a feel-good message that makes them feel good. And there's nothing wrong with coming to a congregation or a church and wanting to feel good. We should feel good because we are serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. Right. However, I would rather hear the truth of God's Word and have it change my life than to feel good today and be unchanged tomorrow. That's right. It is time we take sin seriously. Since 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 tells us what sin is, it says that it is the transgression of the law or the Torah. Could we then read Hebrews 10, 26 as this? If we willfully transgress the Torah, after having received knowledge of the truth of Torah, there remains no more sacrifice for that sin. Mm. It's time to rethink our obedience to the Word of God. It's time that we take our relationship with our Messiah seriously. It's time that we shape up or we may wake up one day and find out that the good old gospel ship has sailed without us. Is that a position you want to be in? Not me. It's time that we all quit tempting Almighty God. Amen. I have a handout for you tonight. As you know, we are in the midst of the month of a, a lull on, the, on, the, on God's calendar. And this is the month of repentance. When we examine ourselves and when we humble ourselves before God. And we ask Him to search our hearts and try us. And see if there's any wicked way in us so that we can deal with it and get it out. And in less than two weeks now, we are going to come to Yom Teruah, the beginning of the fall fe feast, and that, that day is, is, is the new month, Tishri, for Tishri 1, and it starts the 10 days of awe, which is times when we really focus in on what's in our heart that God needs to deal with so that we can be ready on Yom Kippur, or Yom HaKippurim, biblically, to make confession for our sins and be forgiven by God. Now, we can confess our sins anytime. Thank God for that. I would hate to have to go a whole year with not being able to confess for my sins. But thank God we can confess anytime. And thank God His mercy and grace and loving kindness is there for us. Yes. But it's not a bad idea to spend a month focusing 
on our hearts and the condition, our spiritual condition to see if God can do anything for us. It's a good idea on those 10 days of all to really focus in so that when we come to Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement, or the Day of Atonements literally, that we can make those atonements and God visits us in a very special way and our hearts can be cleansed and made pure and holy. Amen? So, this handout that I have for you, it's, it's, it's technically a lot of these questions that I ask you tonight. And what I want you to do is take these home with you and go over these daily even and ask God to prayerfully help you to answer as many of these questions as you can so that we can be ready to make the, our petitions known unto God that can be forgiven of our sins. Amen? Let's not tempt God. Let's walk in obedience to His Word. And then we won't tempt God. And if we're, if we're walking in obedience to the Word of God, we are not going to willfully sin like, do, like Hebrews 10.26 says, because sin is a transgression of the law. If we're walking in obedience to it, we're not going to be transgressing it. And we don't have to worry about it. Hallelujah. That's right. And that's, where we, that's the state we want to be in. Where we don't have to worry about it because we're walking in obedience to His precious Word. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right.